Welcome to the First Issue Club comic book podcast, your weekly reading club for new comics, news, and stories. I'm Mike D. I'm Greg. And I am Vargas. And we are here again to get to it. Chop it up. Chip, chop, chip. So glad to see you guys. I'm having comic withdrawal. It's only been a week, man. Oh, we did meet over the weekend, though. We did meet over the weekend. We Minicon went- at Minicon. a bar. It was cool. More bars should do this. Mini bar con. Yeah. Have a drink. Loosen up. Those retailers get you spending money easier. It actually is <laughs> ingenious. Like We went there and showed up. Uh, it was put on by Best Car Books. They're yeah. friends of ours now. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> when people meet us, instant friends. <laughs> and uh, we peruse their well, wares. We'll see what they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Best Car Books. Reach out to us. We, we're friends. We're big time friends. And they had some great comic books there, some great vendors. And then I spent money. American yes. Tender, and then went and got some chicken tenders and some beer at the bar. Ain't that living. And I got buzzed, and I went and <laughs> bought some more books. Yeah. This was great. I think having such a smaller scale thing that's convention style mm-hmm. lent itself really well to fun, genuine conversations with people. Yeah. Because when you're at a big convention, one, the vendors are just trying to like make numbers, <laughs> they right? They do not give a and shit. And they're trying to move you through. Yeah. And then- Two, the strangers that you meet are are kind of like, I don't know who you are. Like, even though we're like like-minded people because we're all here, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. There's just not like a sense of like talking it up, chatting it up with yeah. just random people near you. And uh, that, that changed in this like smaller space. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll say something controversial, but it's not meant to be controversial. Oh, my God. Comic-Cons are... Filled with filthy casuals. <laughs> and I'm serious. You go up to one of them, you're just like, what's Ms. Marvel's first appearance? And they say, get away from me, freak. And you're like, wrong. And then and we're like, Greg, stop doing that. You do that to everyone. Quit I challenging to, people. I have to vet everyone you're, at Comic-Con. This is not a place to be aggro. I've been kicked out of 18 Comic-Cons this year. <laughs> this year. And so, but you're right, though. Like, these smaller cons, you can... Yeah, people are there for comic books, yeah, not you can just, through just books, like a... Uh, Pop Back. culture thing. Yeah, it's great. I didn't get hit with a giant plastic sword. 13 different Deadpools didn't come up to me bugging me about stupid shit. <laughs> I didn't pay $25 for a slice of pizza from Papa John's. I was living easy. Yeah. And I won a raffle. You did win a raffle item, a really like a shiny jock cover, right? Yeah, it was Batman 126. 128. 128. <laughs> As you can see, Andy wants it more than I do. <laughs> Josh Williamson's last issue before... Is that true? I, no, I liked, no, that's that's not the, right. Chip's first. Yeah, no, 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 that's no, not no. Right. It, no, no, it was no, a no, Williamson no. issue. It was a Williamson issue. Well, pardon the fuck. Maybe out it was me, the folks. maybe it was the first Williamson issue. Maybe, or maybe a middle one. I, contrary to popular opinion, really enjoyed the Josh Williamson series. Who didn't Do, like it? I think a lot of people yeah. had problems well, with it. A lot of people didn't like it. Really? Yeah. Well, hmm. and I also think that people wanted something different out of it and he was in a tough situation because all he was really doing was bridging a gap between when Chip Zdarsky could start yeah. and Yeah, cuz Tunyon left kind of abruptly. And when yeah, he left. So, thanks Substack. I yeah, he, he given, to... given the cards he was dealt to like be like, "Hey, you have to take Batman out of Gotham because you can't play with anything in Gotham because Chip Zdarsky is going to set. Because <laughs> we have to figure out what the fuck is going to happen. These things in motion, yeah, potentially. So, like, his his hands were kind of tied. And I think he did told, like, a really fun, like, trade-sized story. If you want to put it in anyone's hands on an Audible, you go to Josh Williamson. Yeah, especially the given the roster that DC has. Yeah. Right? Like, he is a guy who can do it. Like, I, I don't know if either of you guys read his Flash stuff. But it's oh, like he wrote the Flash for like what a hundred years? Yeah, <laughs> one hundred years. It's so good though. Like all right. of it is just back to back, and it, solid stuff. And if you can get people to say, "Man, that Flash comic was really good for <laughs> mo- o- for over a month," yeah, you're doing something really well. He did it for years. Yeah. Like Flash stuff, it it confuses me a lot because it gets all wonky with the time stuff. But yeah, yeah, he's been on. Or he was on Flash for a very long time. Yeah, and they're getting him to do... He's doing Justice League, right? Isn't he I think the, so, yeah. the next JL writer? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it. That's that's the prestige spot, right? 
in in DC. In DC, yeah. It's well, yeah. It's Justice League or Batman, Batman or Superman. Yeah, and he's written all of them. Mm-hmm. So get fucked, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> haters. I, I really like that Robin series. Um, R.I.P. Oh, yeah. I, I was yeah. bummed it ended, but um, I don't know. It also came to a good natural conclusion and and kind of wrapped its story into yeah. Batman v. Robin. and There's a great article out there. I want to say it's a Bleeding Cool article, which I don't say a lot because I'm not a huge Bleeding Cool fan. But they wrote a great article that was the, – the headline was like, DC's pandering to the heterosexual crowd yeah. with the Robin series. With the series. new Robin series. Yeah. Oh great. My God. Just great, great satirical article. And when Mike brought this up, a lot of people were angry at the article because I don't think they knew it was satirical. Yeah, I mean, it was written really deadpan. Like, and <laughs> so a lot of people are just like, do you see what Bleeding Cool's writing? And it's just like, yeah, it's pretty funny, yeah. right? Like, it's a, it's a joke. Yeah. It shows you also. It also shows you how much people don't really read articles. You just see a headline and get mad. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I've made it this far. <laughs> I, I did the same thing, and then I read the article. I was like, what the hell? Oh, speaking of articles... We have started to do reviews on the website. Andy, hey. just, Andy just dropped his first one, All nope. Against All. Uh, so go to firstissueclub.com. We have a new little tab there called Blog. <laughs> Intuitively titled, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We mm-hmm. had a lot of back and forth on this. We 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 workshopped that for <laughs> like six months. Is it news? Is it journal? Yeah. Is it Andy's Corner? Reviews. <laughs> We also had to hack into the matrix to get it onto the website. So I, I learned C plus <laughs> plus, and I know how to speak binary now. So it's pretty cool. Great. I've got a, just a tidbit of comic book news, just a morsel, and it's it's making some ripples the last couple of days, and it is about I think a lot of different publishers uh, not paying creators. Or or mishandling what? contracts, and I think this is this is nothing new really in comic books where like a publisher screws over a creator, and not everything was handled how it was supposed to be. Are these larger publishers or just are like the smaller independent? It's ones? It's mostly smaller independent publishers. Bummer. But because of it being well, aftershock has been a story really this past week because Yikes. a couple people have come out and said. Hey, I, you know, so many people are asking me what happened to this book. One of the books was uh, "Brother of All Men," that mm-hmm. I gushed about yeah. on the podcast a couple months back. Yeah, and that book just kind of cold stopped out of nowhere, and it was because AfterShock wasn't paying Zach Thompson for uh, anything, anything, apparently, right? Um, and so Alex DeCampi came out and said, "Hey, this isn't just Zach. This is." A ton of other people hear these situations that have happened before um, and kind of explained this precarious situation wherein, like, as comic book fans, we want to support our creators that we love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think an initial fan reaction might be, well, I'm not going to buy Aftershock books. Yeah. But when you stop buying Aftershock books... Then they really can't pay people. Then they really can't pay people, and your creators like really aren't making money and getting the coverage that they deserve. So it's just a it's just a dicey thing, and I think a lot of people are looking to pursue legal action more. Yeah. So things like this don't happen. And in fact, there is a class action lawsuit oh. against Action Lab. Oh, good. Who has, who <laughs> yeah. has apparently... Like kind of disappeared out of the, out of the blue last year. They're actually year. notorious for not paying. Yeah, people. there were so many issues that <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> Buzzinga. <laughs> but uh, so many problems with artists not being compensated, and then on top of all that, the last free comic book day, they released an issue of Prince List for free, which is like Action Lab's biggest comic. It's it's okay. got like ten volumes or something, which is like huge for an Action Lab size. Yeah, could have fooled me. Publisher, um, and the Princeless uh, creative team were not told their comic was going to be coming out on Free Comic Book Day. Mm-hmm. Were not asked or consulted. Uh, the way that the book was framed 
was that more books are coming soon to Action Lab. So people are expecting Uh a follow-up to this book. And they're like, we haven't written or created anything else in this run yet because you still owe us for like tons of issues of this comic. Holy shit. Um, so Action Lab's in some in some trouble, and hopefully whatever happens with this lawsuit, our creators get taken care of. And you hate to see indie publishers um, go under, and I don't know many of the reasons why with any small company and small business there's going to be financial issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I mean, think yeah, they, yeah. they seem particular. They seem like particularly bad because they weren't, promoting things the way they said they would. They weren't releasing things on time. And that sort of stuff really fucks creators. Aftershock wasn't or, or Action Lab? Action Lab yeah. in particular. But hey, same thing goes for uh, Aftershock with mm-hmm. some of their titles recently. You, yeah, you, you'd like to have more transparency transparency with that situation because like, you know, if you give someone 20 bucks and then they lost it, you're like, well, well where'd the 20 bucks go? It's just like people are buying Aftershock comics Where's that money going? And like, you, it should be just like funneled right into the creator or right into the company or print. Or I mean, like, huge yeah. questions are coming up with that uh, scenario right now. Yeah. So. Uh, um, another legal thing was I just saw that the comic book uh, creators union or like the image. I can't remember what they call it. The the workers, union that came out of Image. Yeah, like okay. the Comic Workers United yeah. or whatever Some, they call yeah, it. Something, it's, it's something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they filed their first grievance, um, and it was, like, legalia that I've got no concept of. Oh, no. Like, what the issue is. <laughs> but apparently something is happening, and I thought that was worth throwing in with a mention here because... Yeah. Um, they have more of a voice People now. in the industry, yeah, it seems like need a voice or need some follow-up. Um, <laughs> I hope not, it's for, like, PTO or something. Not just shit. staff at Image, but just your creators in general need some more representation so they can do something about this. Uh, <laughs> now, as I understand it, the, the image union is just for people that work. Staff. Yeah, staff at Image Comics. Not, not the creators, right. artists, etc. Right. Because they're, are they like commission-based or freelance for image stuff? Because like it's creator-owned, so I guess it wouldn't be like a... Um, no, the workers there are... I mean like the like writers and artists because yeah. they're not commissioned out to do a book they come with their book to image yeah exactly yeah, right yeah. anyway i'm not sure all the financial agreements but yeah you could think of... <laughs> stop the show pump the brakes <laughs> let's get into the, all the legal talk for the show you know something i have noticed recently specifically with image books and dark horse too but a, a lot of the books now aren't like Oh, it's not Scott Snyder writing the book. It's well, Scott Snyder's writing it, but like his Scott Snyder's company owns the book, mm-hmm. and they get credit for it in the image title. You know what I'm saying? So like, Best Jacket Productions is Scott Snyder's. Oh, like a company, uh-huh. like his LLC or whatever, like an imprint. Yeah, is on image, but it's not an imprint. It's like Scott Snyder sure, owns yeah. this company. He owns the rights to the comic. And that company has sold those whatever printing and distribution rights, I guess, to Image. Is that like Skybound? Kind of the same thing? Because that's, that's Kirkman's. Is a proper imprint. That is an imprint. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because Kirkman's still, whatever, he's CEO or CFO or something of Image. Yeah. I, he probably signed some checks here and there. Yeah. So I, I have been noticing that that is, and I, I noticed it on one of the books I'll be talking about, um, Tim Seeley's book. Uh, there's like a company, whatever. Oh, like interesting. Information in there, hmm. and I don't know if that's his, you know, Sealy's company, but I thought it was interesting. People it, are finding new and interesting ways to make sure that they get paid. Yeah, if any comic book lawyers out there want to come explain wanna, it to wanna me, want to come on the show. <laughs> uh, good luck. <laughs> because we're going to be annoyed. Idiots, because yeah. we're going to be annoyed to talk we're to. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, do you have to bring your own gavel to court? <laughs> oh, you, we dropped you from the Zoom. You still there? <laughs> Does the bailiff play the Law and Order music, or <laughs> is that just piped? Is in? Judge Judy nice? <laughs> Let's get down to brass tacks. 
if there is a legal battle on a plane, can you do you have jurisdiction on the plane? Uh, yeah, if you're over international waters. Like, you know, people are just like, is there a doctor on the plane if, like, someone gets hurt? Yeah. Let's say someone needs to sign a contract. I'm, does, does anyone stand up and go, is there a lawyer on the plane? But probably. I'm, that probably I'm happens cheating. frequently. I'll be sure to edit that part out because uh, <laughs> that joke landed like a plane that's very, on fire. Very well and very safely. <laughs> Since since we're light on news, I, why don't I talk about some personal stuff in my comic book collection life? <laughs> I had that mole removed. <laughs> Things are fine. Just landed a couple new slabs and bought a couple more that are on the way. I think I've got a slab problem. <laughs> Might as well face it, I'm addicted to slabs. Might as well face it, you're addicted to slabs. I think my thing is is that I normally find, and you guys see this in the like our Discord when I share about it. Yeah. But, um, People say stop. I, n- <laughs> I normal I normally find very good prices. Yes. On these things. Yeah. But I think the problem is is that around the holidays, a lot of people are spending their money <laughs> elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So things like collectibles, the market kind of takes a weird dip. Um, on certain collectibles, sure. Yeah, exactly. Or there's some that are never going to dip below a certain yeah. threshold, right? Funko pops. But I think some of your like minor key comics and things like that. Um, minor key. On a, what was that supposed to be like a DJ drop? Like a <laughs> major like major key, key but yeah. like minor, minor key. key. We need a soundboard for this podcast where we can. <laughs> I told you I would buy one. Drop in sounds like that. Oh man, I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. Uh, in any case, I think I'm gonna push the pause button. I've got so many books that I've sought after my entire comic book collecting life. Mm-hmm. Lusted. That I've grabbed in the last two years. Yeah. And I think I, I got to hit a point where I'm like, this is enough for me to be content right now. Can I ask you this? Yeah. You famously have said that instead of spending more money weekly yeah. to buy comics that may p- potentially be worth something, you kind of save your money to drop on the bigger books that you know you want, that you've wanted to fill your collection with. Yeah. I, we've kind of seen this method play out over the last however many months. To it's... would you say too much success, <laughs> or have you have you have you? Sat... I I am a firm believer it, it's in just this like a method monkey's paw still. situation. I am a, I am a firm believer in this method. Still, I think right. So now, when I see a twenty dollar variant or something like that. I'm automatically like, no, not going to spend money on it. Think about the other things I can put that $20 towards Mm -hmm. that are going to sustain their value. Whereas most $20 variants end up being in an online sale for 5 bucks, or you can get them on eBay for $5 at a later time. Right. So a lot of those variants I just don't care about. I'd Mm -hmm. rather something more sound and collectible and proven be in my collection. Yeah. Um, In addition to that, I think you could spec buy like a hundred dollars worth of books every week. You know what I oh, mean? Oh, unfortunately, yes. And that the amount of money that that costs in comparison to seeing what actually becomes a thing mm-hmm. and then dropping ten bucks on it, thirty bucks sometimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're paying another um, five dollars, twenty dollars, right? But you haven't bought shit tons of comics that right. you're not necessarily going to enjoy. You're only buying them because you think a first appearance is going to come up. I don't buy floppies or pre-order floppies that I'm not interested in reading mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah. And that used to be a thing where I was like, this seems like it could be something. Right. And I'd add it to the pre-order. Don't do that anymore. I th- still think this is a good way to handle it. One of my issues is, is that, like I said, with this month, so many key books that have been on my list have... In, have, the, in this week or something on have, eBay? Have just been available over mm-hmm. the last couple months. And so every week I'm like buying a new slabbed comic on eBay because it's $20 cheaper than mm-hmm. it should be going for. It's $40 cheaper than it should be going for. So I'm getting little deals here and there. But the the volume is just too high recently that yeah. I think I need to take a break on. I'm, I'm still I'm still not going to I'm not going to go back to buying like $20 variants. You you never were that kind of guy though to begin no, with. No, I so there's a time where I got into it a little bit, but um, short lived. Short lived, yeah. 
It was a, in, it was in vogue. <laughs> and then it's just blase. But I got um, there's been a couple books recently that a, a couple years ago were books that I thought I'd never get my hands on. One is X Men 141, which is right above me, which is the Days of Future Past cover. Um, yes, with all the apprehended slain behind yep. Wolverine and Kitty Pride. Mm-hmm. Um, got that one, and then I've got a Dazzler first appearance on the way. Most of I've been trying to collect the X Men issues 100 through 200 um, for a while, mm-hmm. and I've hit the majority of really pricey books in that run now. Nice. And so now I'm kind of like filling out the. So I think my like the dollar bin section. My my nighttime eBay browsing is going to be more like little lots here and there. Right. Um smaller deals on things but not necessarily the books that I feel like I need to have graded. So wait, so you're saying you you filled X-Men 100 through 200 or you're you're doing that. I'm doing that, but I've gotten Does that mean you're going to pivot? If a book goes for like over 100 bucks, I've already got it in my collection, so now it's easier to get the smaller yeah, stuff. Yeah. But so what I'm saying is if you finish 100 to 200, are you going to do 100 down to 1? Is that like is that no. the next logical step? There's no 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 way. Okay, I I just need to I'm bracing says, myself for what now. Yeah, I just need to know what I need to brace myself for with your collection. What now. is it? Ninety four, like the first Claremont book. Mm-hmm. It's like a three thousand dollar book, right? What? No. Yeah, but you said you can get it for twenty or forty dollars cheaper than. <laughs> so. I mean, you can't turn that up. If you can get yeah. it for forty dollars cheap, yeah, man, that's twenty six hundred dollars. Yeah, ninety four is like the first. Did you not know that? That's a Ford Taurus. That's a. Um... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we want to get into new comics? Yeah. Let's talk about our new comic books. Biddy bop ba up new comic books. Comic book talk. Comic book talk. I'm doing this because no one has sent us a song. That was really good, Greg. Thanks. I was bopping it. C minus. That's not my best, but I appreciate it, Andy. Yeah. I was I didn't give you a grade. I was just trying to boost your ego. I'm like <laughs> it's the real one. it's real yin yang over here. <laughs> Lift me up, shove me down. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> gotta just, keep your balance. It just happens that Vargas yeah. dressed as an angel with a little halo and I have my little devil horns yeah, yeah. on. You're and... both sitting on my shoulders, mm-hmm. which is really weird. It's true. I told Kara that I, I feel when I'm on this podcast that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I didn't tell her that it was literal. It was quite literal. That's, that's how we record in a stack. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Hollywood Squares. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we'll start. Um, we'll be me. Sure. <laughs> as I'm referring the to myself royal we, yeah. in the third sense now. Uh, Vargas and I both read Hexware by Tim Seeley, Zell Moscato, and uh, sorry, sorry, Zell Moscato, Lavia, and Valentina Cuomo. Mm-hmm. Title on Image Comics. Uh, I'll read the blurb here for you. The Puppet Tree. Why sell your soul when you can buy a new one? In a corporate-ruled world where class inequality is greater than ever, a desperate, lonely populace is drawn to neo-spiritualism and hedge magic. When their teenage daughter is murdered, the the Marx family is left asking the gods what they did to deserve this. But their android maid, Witchware, has a different approach. (laughs) What is the synopsis? Perhaps if she (laughs) asks the devil... Now listen. Yeah, man, that's a <laughs> now bad listen. synopsis. Now of a listen. Great comic. Now listen. Yes, a lot of conflicting things happening yeah. here, and you think, Pew wee, what a mess. Does not play out that way. Yeah, it is. Tim Seeley really paints a beautiful picture of this world that is um, so futuristically inclined and forward. It's like classic cyberpunk. That like they have they have everything at their fingertips now. They have yeah. androids that can do anything, you know, doors that swoosh open, books that read themselves. Like, but this is all technology. It's all technology. What, they've what, reached what, the limit. What was the deal with the hedge witch thing, though? Thank you for asking. Now people want to seek outside of technology, so they go to like these soothsayers that are like, you know, spiritually inclined, like um, like uh, gurus or some kind of spiritual guide. Yeah to get influence on what they should do with their everyday lives. Not so uncommon with the super rich now of just like, 
you know, going to see like nutritionists or working out. You know, alternative stu- medicine. You know, stuff, stuff that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like therapy, for yeah. example. Yeah, therapy. <laughs> or just going to see a doctor about that cough you've had for a while. Yeah, drinking water. Stupid stuff. There's water in my Pop-Tart. I don't need to... <laughs> that stuff lives in the toilet. I'm not going to drink yeah. it. Yeah, fish fucking that. I'm not drinking water. Do you guys have an issue with drinking water from a bathroom tap? No. Neither do I. Who does? My mom. Okay, so... My like, mother will not drink water from the bathroom tap. Like the faucet? The faucet. The sink? Okay. Mm-hmm. I will drink water from the fucking shower tub, head. shower head, <laughs> yeah. the garden hose. Like, I, I made I'm, a joke about that, but I have drunk water from a toilet, so... <laughs> Which, wait, okay. The I mean, tank, I the hope. T- yeah, from the tank. It's filtered. <laughs> yeah. I put my Brita in there. It's... Well, it's... Whatever. Let's get back to Hexware. So... <laughs> So the cool part about Hexware is there's, they li- they live in this technology world, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this teenager gets killed, and the robot maid takes it upon herself to read this library of occult books, mm-hmm. right? Well, Magic yeah. books. There's many different religious texts there. Yeah, and, and so she just she... reads all of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the what she does is. Instead of offering her soul to the devil for power, she buys a soul from, well, I say the devil. We we really we don't, don't know. know. A demon of some variety. So now she is a robot with still robot thoughts, but also has a soul now mm-hmm. and has to go avenge this murder. And that's cool. Yeah. On top of that, like hunt demons or something that's what the kind of yes. the vibe i got so, from the end so the deal was this this demon said okay i'll give you a soul however some souls have escaped here or have avoided death way too long so like i need you to go on this john wick journey with your new soul in your robot body and help me get them back into here yeah which is very fucking rad <laughs> it's like you know uh the devil wears prada meets um blade runner yeah, sure. And I only say Devil Wear Prada because it has devil in the name. I never actually saw Devil Wears Prada. I'm assuming it's about the devil? Yeah, I mean, it's about a fashion magazine, but yeah. <laughs> Sadistic. Yeah, it's it's super good story. Mm-hmm. Um, Tim, Tim Seeley knows how to write this stuff. Like, he writes badass chicks mm-hmm. and so reven- well. And revenge tales yeah. and vengeance and... He even said today on Twitter, he was just like, listen, this was a big deal for me to write this book because it was kind of out of left field of what I typically write. Yeah. It's like it was in a new genre. It was in a new kind of space that I haven't explored much. And he was just like, I'm very thankful that people really liked the first issue, first issue, because I was, you know, really hesitant about it. And um, I don't know. Is it ongoing? I almost asked him. Because we were having kind of a little back and forth on Twitter. Uh, I almost asked him if it was ongoing or limited. Yeah. Because the speed of the first issue makes me think it's going to be a limited. It was quick. But it has legs. I mean, I think this story could... Literally, she has legs. The android has legs. It's true. She She doesn't doesn't have arms anymore. Not a Rosie the Robot type. No, unfortunately not. Mr. Jetson, the devil's here. (laughs) He took Elroy. God. Tim Seeley read that book. The Jetsons, the Jet, the Jetsons meet the devil. Does that have legs? Yeah, yeah, definitely, one hundred percent. I think personal opinion here. I think if you insert the devil into any book, two thumbs up. Yeah, sure. Uh huh. Big devil guy well, over here. We, it comes back to being raised Catholic. We love this shit. <laughs> we we love the devil. Have you seen Warrior Nun? Yeah. Caitlin loves that fucking show. That show's fun. It's on its second season. She, like, just destroyed it. It's based on a comic. You know that, right? It is based on a comic, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, I haven't watched it. She watches a bunch of stuff that I don't watch. One of my favorite shows is Evil. I need to watch that. Yeah, that's it on my watch It is so list. good. Mike Coulter, who was Luke Cage, mm-hmm. plays a priest in it. And it's him and somebody that go, like, inspect the occult. And it was very, like... It starts as like a procedural sort of like they investigate one thing per episode and 
there's not like an ongoing arc and then it slowly turns into something else and you're like, holy shit. Yeah, you, the way you described it sounds very fucking rad. I think it's a great show, but it unfortunately got relegated to Paramount Plus, mm-hmm. yeah. which is a streamer that like is kind of a tough pill to swallow. Just because they don't have, they've got the Star Trek. Yeah, how much Star Trek lower do you decks, want? And then like every other, <laughs> yeah. As then, much as you can give me. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, Trekkies are getting their Trek elsewhere already. You know what I mean? I don't know that you need a streaming service just for Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, I think anyone who refers to themselves as a Trekkie would disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Picard, Discovery, Stranger Worlds, whatever. Yeah. The lower, anima- decks. lower Decks. That's like the animated one. Lower right, Decks yeah. is great. Those are those are the four I can think of yeah, Trek, off the top of Trekkies my head. Trekkies are really eaten. Yeah, but so well, are Star Wars fans with oh, Disney Plus. So Star Wars fans, yeah. yeah. But if you're Paramount Plus, I'm surprised they haven't launched the Office Verse or whatever yet. Shut you up! Know what I mean? Shut or the fuck up! Do <laughs> not even put that into the universe. That's Peacock. Oh, that's Peacock. That's yeah. why. <laughs> and they're probably making. They're just probably gobbling cash just from people wanting to watch The Office. Yeah, and Parks and Rec, and yeah. 30 Rock and all that bullshit. Uh, awesome content is what you meant by bullshit. Yeah. I'm, I I I do like The Office a lot and all those NBC shows, but uh, God damn it, I do not need Office spinoffs in my life and everyone quoting that shit all the time. It, it had its moment in time, and it's done. It's, it's done. Yeah, all right. Okay. I don't need okay. any more staplers in Jell-O. I don't need... <laughs> Three hole punch, Jim. I'm, but people I'm gonna, are saying the same thing about superhero movies. You know that? No, they're not. <laughs> I'm gonna get you all the office bullshit Walmart has to offer for Christmas. I'll, I'll take it. I'll <laughs> gladly take it. I love it, but I don't need new fandom. Um. So, anything else on that book? Um. It was good. Great. Yeah, it's super good. I I'm behind on this one. Um. But I just read Brian Michael Bendis's. The ones, oh yeah, no one's covered that yet on the podcast, have they? Uh uh-uh. uh Um, I really enjoyed it. I want to say it was on Dark Horse. Yeah, I've heard good things about it. Yes, so it the concept is there's a bunch of like chosen ones, and there's the guy who is like his job is to like gather all the chosen ones mm-hmm. for like finding a supreme chosen, like the chosen one above all chosen ones, oh. who is like about to be born. And then you find out that it's a, uh, I think that the ultimate chosen one is Satan. So this is in the, this is in the, your wheelhouse, Greg. <laughs> it's a devil book. Yeah. How have I not heard about this? <laughs> and so all the previous, there's some really fun um, themes in it. Um, one of which is like these people who are chosen ones kind of have their purpose. And once they've served that purpose. Mm-hmm. They die? It's like, well, I'm. Am I like a has been now? A washed like, up one. Do people like people see me on the street and they're like, "Hey, it's a chosen one." <laughs> <laughs> do a miracle, idiot! <laughs> yeah, and it's like, come on. Um, so there's some of that going on. There's some people who have like more like superpowers and are more celebrities. So it's a weird mix mismatch of people that got forced together on a team and they've got to kind of make a decision on. Uh, what to do about this Satan baby? Did they... Satan baby. <laughs> <laughs> we we are just switching around a couple letters there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Do it. So do they? Are they welcoming the Satan baby? Yeah, are like, they pro? Oh, this will be great. Like, Anti Satan. This is a conundrum. Imagine someone's gathered you and several other people into a room, right? And said, "Satan's been born. What next? What do we do?" And you're just like, I'm not going to kill a baby. Well, no. I'm well, saying, look, now hold on. If I've and learned you one... believe that Satan's been born, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah we're going to need probably, more evidence you here. You probably don't. Yeah, if I believe that Satan's been born and I've okay. seen the omen, mm-hmm. I'm going to grab all seven of those daggers and I'm going to kill that child. <laughs> Bye-bye, Satan baby. Yeah, hard Vargas stance. I'll kill a baby, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, like, is the is is the... The chosen one, one, aka Satan baby, in this book, is it like foretold that he will do something bad or good or change everything up? Yeah, bring, like bring the end of days, basically. Oh, uh, so that up, baby's gotta fucking go. Up Sorry. To this point, the chosen ones. Are, I have shit to do. Are, I got Cole's cash that I haven't spent yet. Sorry, you gotta go. Cole's cash. 
<laughs> New Dockers. I had a. I might have told this story before. I had a buddy that I a guy that I <laughs> his work, wife gave birth to Satan. <laughs> a guy that I work with. Uh, me and him won the company's uh tickets for they do like a raffle for all the sports team tickets that right. they've got season tickets to. And we won the tickets for Sporting Kansas City, which is Kansas City's local MLS team. Mm-hmm. So we had great seats behind the bench. Yeah. And there's a Hooters right by there. And he was like Hooters is a restaurant um where women <laughs> don't wear clothes and serve you chicken wings and hot dogs. And he was like, Meet me at the Hooters and I was like uh, all right, like, and you're like as a joke. Yeah, I was like, like wait outside the Hooters, and he was like, no, let's grab a bite and a beer. And I was like, man, Ooh. I I don't know if I've ever been inside of a Hooters before, but I went there, and then he texted me right when I got there, and was like, hey, I'm gonna be a little late uh, to Hooters. My Kohl's cash expires today. <laughs> what? <laughs> Who <laughs> is this human? <laughs> Did you get lunch with and, David Spade? And I, I was like, that's the worst sentence I've ever heard. Sorry, I'm running late to Hooters. My Kohl's cash is expiring. <laughs> I've got to take care of this. And so I'm sitting by myself at Hooters while this um, my buddy from work is spending his Kohl's cash and rushing over as quick as he can. So, but we had a great time at the game. Great guy. Um, it was just a that's just an insane sentence that pops into my head every time. I just am now getting this image of a very lonely Mike at a Hooters yeah. having to explain to the waitresses, "I swear to God, my friend is coming. He's buying khakis. <laughs> Please don't get your manager." Why? When I maybe I only think of, I think of khakis when I hear Coles because of the KH. I, I've always only go to Coles to get khakis as a kid. My mom was just like, "Oh, you need." This for school. It's the khaki Kohl's. zone. Yeah. They should sell store brand and call them Kohl Keys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm tweeting that now. Yeah. Oh, man. You took my joke. <laughs> also, I go to Hooters all the time. Really? And that is not a joke. I love Hooters. What do I got? Chicken wings. Is it chicken wings and hot dogs? I love their chicken wings. Has the attire changed for the lates? I mean, they do wear clothes. I'd like to clarify. Mm-hmm. They're just hot pants and and short and sh- yeah, short t-shirts. Okay, I've never been to a Hooters. Oh, we gotta go to Hooters. Do we? Yeah, man. Their chicken wings are bomb. <laughs> I'm just like, I wear a shirt that just says, "I'm just here for the chicken wings." Dude, I'm married. I'm here for the chicken wings. I yeah. I bring Kara to Hooters all the time. We probably go once a month. Is Hooters <laughs> kind of like Twin Peaks? Twin Peaks. I I've I have, been like sexy restaurants. Yeah, I have just started going to Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. and they show way more skin at Twin Peaks than they do at Hooters. Okay, is there a male version of that? There should be. Like, I don't long know. necks, dongers, <laughs> Sl- slongers. Come get your coleslaw, at slongers. <laughs> the pro- uh. <laughs> the problem. One of my issues with it would be, I think I'd feel better about Hooters. And Twin Peaks, if there were comparable restaurants with men servers, mm-hmm. uh, but the amount of hair that would be <laughs> no man. floating around, I think would be an issue with food. Uh uh-uh. uh If if you're working at at Schlonger's, you're you're shaven, you're shorn. Yeah, you have to <laughs> you're be shorn. Shaved. I I 100 agree with that. Or you go there because there is hair in your food. Maybe that's like that's just a bonus. Yeah, you get a little floss action with your. You put in a Vaseline dogs. all over your chest. Those hairs aren't gonna go anywhere. That's true too. Or maybe you just wear like a hairnet, but it's a bodysuit. <laughs> so fishnets, yeah. <laughs> just one, yeah. one giant fishnet. <laughs> Me and Greg are just too big of a sn- too big of snowflakes to handle Hooters. So here's what's gonna happen: <laughs> we're gonna video ourselves for the Patreon going to Hooters with uh, Andy. Well, yeah, I don't. A recording no, device in, in Hooters. Hooters. That's no, a gigantic a red flag. No-go. They're gonna be like, no, 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 yeah, no, no. There's three like nerds going into Whatever Hooters with a camera. Fucking shenanigans, you idiots have yeah, planned. You're leaving now. We are not doing. Yeah, your wings are to go. <laughs> Someone's just immediately just like this. No, that's all you have. Just two words. <laughs> they just meet you at the door. Ah, uh-uh. yeah, not happening. <laughs> We're avid listeners of First Issue Club. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> Vargas, you can come in. We have your table. <laughs> yeah. Your friends stay outside. 
the next book I read was Know Your Station by Sarah Gailey and Liana Kangas. Uh, the wealthiest people, sorry, the wealthiest people in the solar system abandoned the Earth for a private sanctuary in space, leaving the rest of us to die amidst cataclysmic climate change. But the one percent won't be safe for long. A murderer is on the loose, specifically targeting the super rich. So there is like this big, uh, giant space station in space, in like. Just like it says, the super wealthy go there to avoid climate change and the earth that we have helped destroy. <laughs> and each uh, like deck has a different kind of station and a different um, like head manager of that station. And you get to know everyone that works on the station. And everyone on the crew is given this like drug called like blue to like keep you motivated to go and like kind of like make it a lot easier. Because if you're on the crew, you're basically like the dredges of the earth and you get this job to get off of earth to like kind of be in a livable area. It's like, like a serotonin mood booster sort of thing. Yeah. But it's more like uh, methamphetamines. Oh <laughs> yeah. It's more it, like trucker. Yeah. Style. It's yeah, yeah. It's like, it's okay. like, it's like speed. Like the yellow to, jackets. Yep. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, just like the, the synopsis said, like, a murder murders keep happening on this ship and like this person who is like the security liaison is tasked with figuring out who it is because um a real cop from earth comes up to the station just to like help out because uh the security liaison isn't like a sheriff or any kind of uh you know law enforcement they're just like you or I who have joined up to be on the ship and you're just you know, like a Coles manager, you're just there to kind of keep the peace and make sure that cash the cash, <laughs> cash the Coles cash, cash the khaki Coles cash. Yeah, and so, um, like the the ship has sentience, and so like you can like talk to it like Q or oh, yeah. like um, uh, Hal, uh, Hal, classic example of talking spaceship, right? And Hal's from that movie. 2001 Space Odyssey. Right, which Scott Snyder did. Um, <laughs> famously. Kidding. Famously. Uh, Zack Snyder, sorry. Um, and so, yeah, so the, like, uh, the police officer is just like, you know, I'm here to help. You're like, uh, you're. I don't work for you. You don't work for me. I'm just here to help you, like, figure it out. And at the end of the book, you discover that the police officer's dead. <laughs> like, she's been killed. Hell yeah. And you're kind of given this, like, I don't know if it's a red herring or, like, a... Uh, um, you know, a little hint, but she, the security li- liaison is like each night takes like a little too much blue to kind of like unwind from the day. Mm-hmm. Cause like, if you take the right amount, it kind of like gives you a little trip. And she always tells the computer, to, the computer to turn off like her tracking stuff just so she can be kind of like left alone. Mm-hmm. So while she's under this hypnotic drug, she's also like untraceable. Yeah. So she thinks that, you know, am I doing this? And uh, uh, we, we will find out as the story goes on. A werewolf sort of situation. You think there's a werewolf on the or ship? Or a uh, <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde sort of situation. Maybe, or just like she's high. I don't want the ship she, to be killing them. I think that's what's happening. God, that's so legit. Because oh, that, Remember that Jeff Lemire book, Sentient? That book, that book was so oh, good. Uh, so good. So fucking good. Out on TKO. Who wrote this book? Do you know? Who wrote this book? I did. I said at the beginning, actually. It was it. by Sarah Gailey and Liana Kangas. Okay. I don't know them. Um, Sarah Gailey wrote Eat the Rich. Oh, I did like that book. And Liana Kangas uh, illustrated True Kilt. Kilt? Cult. True Cult. True yeah. Cult. Oh, because it's a V, that's but it a, should be you. That's a Kickstarter book. It was a Kickstarter book, yes. but it got finally pushed to Dark Horse, I think, yeah. or something like that. If I, if I got that wrong, I apologize. But Super good. It's really it's a great book, illustrated well, written well. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes. I kind of hope the ship is killing people. Yeah, man. Because like the ship, the ship and the security li- liaison have like formed this really fun relationship, where it's just like kind of an odd couple thing. Where this this security liaison is like a fucking mess. She's like overworked, aren't we all? Overstressed, love it a drug, and uh, the ship's just like, hey, you you gotta get up. It's time to go to work. And the 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 ship keeps giving her this thing called sober gum, which basically <laughs> like takes the edge off from blue, yeah. is, which is the drug that they're given. 
and um I don't know. It's it's a very fun, you know, procedural who done it yeah. murder mystery on a ship, and it tackles class issues and um, murder issues and space <laughs> issues. It, those classic uh, space issues. All the issues that are plaguing us today, really. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I'm gonna have to pick that up. Yeah, that's right. Totally. My, that's right in my wheelhouse. Anything with space issues <laughs> and things perter- pertaining to space. Just just for this book. Yeah. And baby, it's there's a lot. I also read uh It's Only Teenage Wasteland by Kurt Prize, Jaco- Jacoby Sal- Salcido, and Mark Dale. Um this is a classic parents go out of town and we're throwing a rager. How many books did you read? I read four books. Wow. I was not busy at work. <laughs> <laughs> this is a classic uh, teenage story. My parents are going out of town. We're gonna throw a party. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the first issue is a lot about setting up who these kind of outcasts are. But they're like cool outcasts. They're just like we listen to the Pixies and like, and you know, in high school they're just like you're weird. <laughs> but actually, you turn out pretty fucking cool if you listen listen to the Pixies. Turns out. Um, <laughs> And so they're like, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and so they're like recruiting like the cool kids that come and the jocks and like just getting like a big amalgamation of like high school yeah. party. And I've had my fair share of high school parties and you get that good mix and it's a good fucking time when your parents go to town. Did you guys ever throw parties when your parents went out of town? I'm the only idiot that did no. that. My parents never went out of town. Oh, bummer. I my Parents went out of town once, and I was gonna have a house show, mm. and have some bands come over and play, including my own. And I chickened out day of, and we moved it to another friend's house because I was in a neighborhood that was just like normal suburbia. Same. And the cops would have gotten called, yeah. and they did immediately. Yep. And I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can distinctly remember four parties that I threw when my mom went out of town. Mm-hmm. Jeez. And the cops showed up. Dose times twice, yes, you... and I say that because I know my mom listens to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom, but it happened, and you probably knew, so shame on you, but thank you. <laughs> and so, you're probably thinking, Well, what else is with this book? Because it can't just be about a rager, yeah, it's a comic book, there's got to be sci fi. Duh, <laughs> as the party gets going, a fight breaks out between like a so they describe him as like this like loner kid who is on the autistic spectrum. Okay. And like this group of ragtag kids have like taken him into their group because they're just like he's a loner like us. He gets picked on for no real reason but mm-hmm. just being different. And so, you know, they kind of pal around with him. They don't like see him as like a burden or or like a you know, a charity case. They're just like they're there's actually like a kind of a cool book of just like acceptance and just like you know, we're, there's no one left behind here in mm-hmm. our group. And so they take him in. He shows up to the party, and these redneck hillbilly k- kids who weren't invited to the party show up and start a fight. And then during the middle of this fight, like, everything turns white. And the comic book turns white, and all the pages turn white. And at the very end, the kid's just like, you see the kid on a, on a hillside, and it's the end of the world. Like, there's, like, weird space crystals all over the place. Hmm. And he's, like, in a – it looks like Earth, but set far in the future or some kind of cataclysmic event has happened. And the the way it is written is sublime. It is so, so good. Because, like, each high school character is written perfectly, like <laughs> like a typical high school kid from the shit they say to, like, how – the main character convinces his sister to help him throw the party. And like, it all felt very believable, very real. Um, you know, except for the time travel bit at the end with the end of the world. Sometimes those books that are kind of exist in the mundane and normalcy, Mm -hmm. it's like a, they can really hit you hard when that twist comes. Right. And slap you upside the head with it. I kind of enjoy that sort of storytelling there's that scene in like i want to say the movie's drive that ryan gosling movie drive yeah um 
where that movie starts out so slow oh, and boring. Whew. And then there's like there's an a, elevator scene. A really intense scene where you're just like, holy shit. And it just hits you so hard because of the pace of the beginning of it. Um, uh, yeah, so I love stuff like that. It sounds like I'd like this book. It reminds me of uh, Paper Girls. Yeah, and so, yeah, uh, that's a great comp. And then they also say that this is for fans of Nice House on the Lake. And what's the furthest place from here? Sure. Yeah. So I, that, I, I will agree with that. This is more Paper girlish to me because they are kind of set in that age group of uh, just young teens having fun, and then something is thrusted upon them. Yeah, that so, sounds legit. I, I I really 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 enjoyed this book. I thought it was fucking awesome. No big two books so far. Look at us. My my only other one was um, Gargoyles from Dynamite. I also read Gargoyles. That book was fucking horny. Yeah. Oh really? So fucking horny. Well, Weird. the show is pretty horny. Uh so you've seen all the seasons, right? All four. Okay, I've seen. I, I know enough to know that they're gargoyles by night and not by day. Yeah, well, you don't need to know anything else. And it, well, it, I guess so because there's like some from Japan, feudal Japan. Yeah, they there's like there's time some, travel stuff. There's, there's some robots. cyborgs yep. with the soul of an old gargoyle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got it. And I was just like, I don't fucking care. I'm just here for the ride. Yeah, and I just I just released that energy into the world <laughs> uh-huh. and I enjoyed it. But these gargoyles, oh my god! I did not remember them being so fucking horny. Oh yeah, they are like geeked up for like each other yes. and humans. Yes, who man? Like actual sexual tension. Yes, like like yeah. So like this- like page two, the gargoyle is kissing. A human. Yeah. Well, and also just like, let's get the fuck out of here and like, yeah, uh, you know, too. You know, like, they're not here yet. Let's go. And I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. How is it not a kid's thing? It's not, the, it's not like, oh, and then they say, let's go fuck each other. It's like, yeah. oh, they're they're going to go fly off together. Okay. And he's just like, I know it's uh, nighttime, but uh, I am pretty hard. <laughs> Gargoyle, stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know any of their names. Goliath is the leader. That's the only one I can So, remember. Gargoyle. Yeah, Gar Gargoyle Gargoyle Goliath Goliath. Sorry, it was fun. It looked cool. The art was great. It looked just like the cartoon. So yeah, I don't think there's going to be a lot of complaints about this book. All right, especially cool. if you like the series. I need to pick up that Amanda Connor cover and have her sign it. At oh my Con. my Amanda Connor uh, Barbie books came in. Hell yeah! So she can sign those at Planet Comic Con. Sick. She nice. will probably go. This is stupid, and then uh, throw it back in my face. But that's fine. I don't. She probably won't. But she's a nice lady. Amanda Connor's great. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Hans just got announced for Planet Comic Con. Mm-hmm. And of course, Dan he lives Ro- right over here. Dan Rosa, Don Rosa. Yep. Excuse me. KC M- Comic Con Classics. <laughs> Mister yep. Scrooge McDuck himself. Staples. That and, guy. Yeah. Phil Hester's coming. All those guys. Yeah. Jeremy Hahn. Uh, Cullen Bunn. Jason Aaron. He hasn't been announced yet. Seriously? I would, I would be shocked if he isn't. Yeah. He basically lives down the road. Yeah. I would think he really enjoys Planet because all the comic book fans in Kansas City have so many things signed by him at this point mm-hmm. that he, I don't feel like his lines are insane. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas when he goes to other conventions... Yeah. I'm sure he's mobbed. It's yeah. just he's got to be absolutely mobbed. Well, and I think for all those local guys, I'm sure it's great because like you go to a local con... The fans there are just like, yeah, you're like, you're the Kansas City guy. This is awesome. Yeah. You're, you're doing so great. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure that's just like a, a big boost for them. Yeah. Which they, they all listen to the show anyway, so they're probably <laughs> blushing right now. They're like, oh my god. I mean, last time at Planet, Amanda Connor's line was big. Was it really? Yes. When was she here last? Probably like four or five years ago. Oh wow. Was Jimmy here? I don't, they have I don't to. remember. They've got to travel. They travel together. together. They, they probably have do. To. Well, I mean, they don't have to travel together just because they're married. Or it he... would be really easy for them to travel together is what I was implying. Listen, I know. Sorry. They probably share Southwest points. It's fine. But, you know, <laughs> he probably went to WonderCon. She went to Planet Comic Con. They can do things separately. It's fine. Sometimes relationships flourish in that kind of atmosphere. You're not wrong. <laughs> Did you read anything else, Greg? Uh, no, that's it. Are you sure? Ding! That's it. I'm done. Well, I read All Against All, but you have to read my review 
on firstissueclub.com. Yep. <laughs> Homework. That's the stipulation. Sorry. Read it. Come back next week and tell us what you thought, class. Um, and I'm also might mess around and keep that article updated as issues come out. Ooh, please Ooh, do. Fun. Might keep that up to date. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. No promises. <laughs> no yeah. promises. This may be the only review we do. But do <laughs> but do check it every day to see if there's updates. Yeah, every yeah. day. Every yeah. single day. Yeah. Hit every page at least twice. Just put Great. a reminder on your phone now. Just Um But the one I did read that I want to talk about is Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. It's out on Oni Press, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. Uh our boy Jim Zub. Which shocked all of us in the room. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh he wrote it and it's illustrated by a guy named Troy Little, which to s- I that's that's got to be a tough job. Was my thought when when I was thinking about like an artist, right? Because mm-hmm. you're writing a, a a book that has a dis- such a distinct art style. Yeah, that's like part of it. Rick and Morty, mm-hmm. right? Justin Roiland's art is yeah, it's iconic know, at this point. You know what it looks like, yeah. right? And you've got to ape that mm-hmm. pretty closely. But still maintain, I don't know, your own thing? I don't know if that's... In- individuality and yeah. your own style, yeah. Um, I mean, it looks great. It looks like an episode of Rick and Morty, which, if that's what you're going for, he nailed it right on the head. Well, I think that's why people come to these comics. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the, the story is really, I think, the best part, because the first, basically, half of the book is them... Number one, railing on the fact that all pop culture does a Cthulhu crossover nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just right there in the text of the book. That's mm-hmm. funny. And the rest of the book is spent railing against how shitty H.P. Lovecraft was. <laughs> he did suck. He was I mean, a terrible person. He's a horrible bigot and just a mean guy. <laughs> Huge racist. Google what his cat's name was. We <laughs> won't talk about it here. Right. But... <laughs> it's rough. Just not a great guy, and so they don't shy away from that at all. Like yeah. they talk about it constantly, and the great part about that is, like, um, Lovecraft Country. Did you guys ever watch that show or read the book? Yeah, I read the book. So that really dwelled on the fact that, like, the person that created this was a horrible person that nobody should celebrate. But the stories they created are something that we can take and live in and own yep. mm-hmm. separately from that creator, right? Um, and this story does that in a in a very Rick and Morty fashion. Right. Uh, they travel through different H.P. Lovecraft stories, um, kind How- of killing his monsters. How, though? D- a different universe. Okay, maybe. so they go to like a different universe. Because like, make Rick and Morty is like a sci-fi. Yeah. Like portal jumping or different planets. I guess or... I should have said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think, I don't anyone think anyone. Yeah. Yet this show needs. That's content. like trying to explain like the Simpsons. There is like we get what the fucking Simpsons is like. The other yellow. And <laughs> they all have they're, jaundice. They're we a get family. it. Family. <laughs> yeah. Very sick. So they yeah they Rick and Morty into like the universe of H.P. Lovecraft. Okay. Right? And they are killing H.P. Lovecraft monsters. Right. So like the first place they go is the farm from color out of space and they talk to the farmer and they're like hey we know you got that thing in your well we're gonna go kill it and he's like what what are you talking and they go out there and they kill the color out of space right Mm -hmm. and they hop to a couple other different places uh because they need to kill all these lesser minions before they kill cthulhu because cthulhu is trying to like you know invade our planet from Mm -hmm. the cthulhu universe of hp lovecraft sick Pretty fun. fun. It, it, you know, it's if if you're a Rick and Morty fan, you'll find a lot to enjoy here. Um, if you're a Lovecraft fan, you'll probably also find a lot to enjoy. Um, if you're a fan of Lovecraft the person, you'll probably hate it. Yeah. And you hate the show, and you hate probably a lot of things. Yeah, a lot of people. Um, but that's fine. It was great. It, I, I really liked it. Um, I've actually never read any Lovecraft stuff. Really? Yeah. It's... Um, it's a, kind of a tough read. It's older. Yeah, it is. It's like, isn't like just like Charles Dickens meets like horror, like the, sci-fi elder god shit. Yeah, the whole like, the thing that makes Lovecraft horror is like, how do you as a regular dude 
process something that is so outside of normal human experience that you can't even describe it with words. Yeah. And that's that's kind of his whole thing, mm-hmm. right? So, like, you see literally an elder god from, you know, the, uh, he- uh, the heaven dimension. of outer space. Yeah, another yeah. dimension, right? How do you how do you live the rest of your life <laughs> dealing with that? I don't know. It's probably the same way that when the first time my son pooped in the tub. It's just like <laughs> uh, you can't you can't imagine. I can't describe it, but I got through it, and yeah, your sanity meter went a little bit lower. Yeah, it broke. <laughs> Did you ever watch the Netflix show uh, Love, Death, and Robots? Oh, one of my favorites. So there is kind of an episode where they, like a military group, finds like a Cthulhu creature. Yep. And I've read that that's like a really good depiction of kind of what H.P. Lovecraft was going for. Yeah. And that episode was fucking terrifying. Mm -hmm. That shit was wild. Yeah. And that's that's exactly right. Um you know you find something underneath the ground that y- yeah. you don't know what it is you don't know where it's from you don't know why it's here you know it just has dark magic keeping it in yeah. there and it wants out very very badly yeah yeah and it is like oh yeah. <laughs> like, and that's the whole thing and that's what makes this rick and morty comic work so well is you take all those like existential dread concepts mm-hmm. but you cross them over with Silly ass Rick and Morty. Yeah, and it works. Re- it works really great. Right. Uh, cool. Jim Zub, Zub's writing it, so yeah. And Jim's oh. a certified hit maker. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Cool. So. That's awesome. There's a lot of great books today. Indeed. Another and another episode in the books. I think you'll hear from us one or two more times before the year ends. The year ends. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we've got maybe a year end special. Around yeah. the corner, we'll write some stuff and pick our favorites. Yeah, I think the plan is to do a best of. Yeah. And then on the website, we're going to post some best holiday comics to read during the year. Okay. And we'll have some Patreon stuff going on. So, yeah, tis the season. We are not going to do our typical over-edited holiday issue this yep. year. We took a big break from those this year because <laughs> they are a production. Which Mike D so beautifully does. Yeah, I've retired. You have retired. We've got to find a new person to do it. Um, but yeah, join us over on the Patreon. Um, Greg's going to open some packages that he got that he forgot what he ordered. So mm-hmm. that'll be a fun surprise. And uh, we're going to, right now, we haven't been charging for the Patreon, but we're going to start back up in the new year. Yep. And post episodes there a little more regularly. Yep. Videos, all kinds of stuff. So it's going to be a good time. We'll see us over there. We'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Bye. First Issue Club is edited and produced by Mike DeStacy and Greg Lichtai. Follow us on social media at First Issue Club and check out our Patreon for videos, audio, and more at patreon.com slash first issue club.